Thank you very much, Anahi. It's a great pleasure to be able to address you uh, once again. So I have a confession to make. I love the technicality of regional anesthesia. I love putting that needle in. It's better than any video game I play. But at the same time, I'm very aware, especially as you know, we teach our residents, that people do get focused on the technicality of that procedure and, and they forget about the rest of it. And although I'm going to be talking about manual competency, I think it's very important to be aware that there are many aspects to, uh, to competence. You have to come with that basis of clinical knowledge. Sure, you have to have that procedural skill. The other component that's very important, though, is attitude. And, and uh, just this morning, talking to uh, some of you at, at Coffee Break, I was struck by the fact, and I think if you stop to think about it, the go-to people that in your institution, the experts that we have here, they are set apart by their attitudes, by their willingness to always question what they're doing and to seek to improve themselves. And I think that's very, very important. When we just talk, though, about the procedural skill, there is more to it than just needling. You do have to start again with the clinical judgment. You want to make sure that you are doing the right block for the right patient for the right surgery. But beyond then, once you've decided to do the block, beyond just sticking that needle in, you want to make sure that you are prepared. Um, and after the block's done, you want to make sure that you have the proper follow-up and that you have the proper skills and knowledge to deal with any unanticipated complications um, of the patient. And this was uh, brought home in an editorial that Sandra Kopp wrote in response to an article we published on hand motion analysis. And uh, she was emphasizing the point that we do need to consider all the other aspects that go into a perfect block. And the question that she raised, which we did as well too, is we need to also think at the end of the day, does technical ability correlate with better outcomes, meaning greater success and fewer complications? I don't know that we will ever have the evidence to, to show this because, as you've seen, our success rates are so high that you know, to, to be able to demonstrate a difference um, is statistically impossible. And similarly with the complication rates, they are fortunately few and far between. So once again, I'm not sure that we'll ever have hard evidence, but I'm sure intuitively we all know that the more skilled you are with the needle, the more likely you are to do a safer and more effective block. So let's turn now to the question of manual competency. And really, the first thing is, what, what should we be assessing? And uh, Brian did present this. If we go to the uh, guidelines for our education and training, you see there that we have identified skill sets that should be associated with proficiency. As he pointed out, some of these are cognitive, um, but some of these two are procedural. Uh, I would argue that the image optimization, because it involves a process of scanning, um, is to some extent procedural. Um, and needle insertion injection, obviously, the big, the big one that we all focus on. The next question, then, is how do we define what competence means? And uh, this definition was uh, a very attractive one that I found in, a, in, a, in the Journal of Nursing. And it describes it as the ability to perform a given task with uh, achieving the desirable outcomes that, that you want from that task, but under the varied circumstances of the real world. And that last bit emphasizes that the competent practitioner is flexible enough to deal with the individual patient in the individual clinical scenario that they come across every day. And in respect to uh, ultrasound-guided peripheral nerve blockade, I think some of these are some of the key things, too, that you want to keep in mind. That, first of all, you do it safely, that they do it effectively, and very importantly for trainees, that they eventually learn to do it independently. And finally, you know, we all work under time pressures. Efficiency, too, is uh, something to think about. But remember, too, that competence really is a continuum of ability. We all are at some point along this continuum, and we're not necessarily looking for proficiency or even expertise in, say, our residents, but a certain level of, uh, of, of minimum ability that they can go out and practice independently. There are several reasons to be concerned with assessment, even if we're not in a teaching um, uh, environment. And these are uh, categorized as such. Number one, it actually is an aid to learning, both for yourself as well as for your, for your students. Um, educational research itself is important, as well as perhaps the issue of certification, which is a thorny one. When we talk about aid to learning, we're really talking about what we call formative assessment. And if you can assess something, you probably have defined certain educational goals. And these goals are, are things that the student can then keep in mind and work towards. 
And it also facilitates what's called deliberate practice, where you, know, you, you enter into a task knowing that this is what you want to achieve. If you fail to achieve it, analyze why you didn't, try it again the next time. But it provides that focus, which has been shown in many, many disciplines to enhance um, uh, speed of learning as well as the uh, durability of learning. And finally, if we don't have assessment, we can't really validate or improve our teaching tools and methods. So it's very important in that regard as well. When it comes to the issue of certification, that's what some people would call summative assessment. And you know, it's kind of a dreaded word for all of us. We don't like to be uh, assessed and have our, our, our competency or our ability to practice uh, dictated to by a professional body. But uh, you know, in a less threatening mode, it, for our trainees, though, it can document their ability to progress to the next level. For example, to progress from a basic to an intermediate level of blocks to a more advanced level of blocks. Um, and I'm going to leave the question of readiness for independent practice to one side. It's too political for this uh, forum. Assessment tools are procedural skills. The methods that you use should fulfill these criteria. Number one, they should be reliable. They should, pre they should, should uh, produce uh, reproducible results in, in most, pay in most uh, students. They should also be valid, which means they should be measuring what they purport to measure, which is manual competency in this regard. Thirdly, they must be feasible. It's no point having something that's impossible to do in practice. And Brian Pollard's elegantly demonstrated that low fidelity models may be the way to go. And they should be comprehensive in, in what they're looking at. So traditionally, we've always just gone by procedure logs, and that those are still in evidence. But it's well known that they're not very reliable. They're probably not very valid in measuring competency. They are extremely feasible, which is why they, they're so popular. And perhaps they're comprehensive, but that really depends on you know, how well those logs are kept. The next thing we have is, again, what we do every day on a day-to-day basis if we have a, a trainee with us, and that's direct observation without any particular criteria. It's very empirical. We say, well, you know, you did that well. You, you did that not quite so well. You did that really badly. And that, again, because it's so subjective, its reliability is called into question. Is it valid? There are some studies to suggest that, yeah, some of us are pretty good at telling who's bad and who's OK and, and who's good. Um, but to it, it, the element of subjectivity that's involved perhaps brings that into question. It certainly is very feasible. And because it's such a global assessment, it's a very comprehensive view, perhaps, of competency. The ones that I'm going to focus on in the, in the next part of my talk are really the, the, the last two. And that's having a systematic way of doing direct observation, which is where you have criteria that you follow. And again, because now you're introducing objectivity, it's going to be reliable. There are studies to suggest that these approaches have, are valid in, in what they, they, they um, purport to measure. Feasibility, they're a little bit more complex to administer, as you can imagine, but they certainly can be made very comprehensive. Last one, because we're talking about procedural skill, and um, you know, when I started looking at this, I was struck, as I'm sure you all have been, by the similarity between ultrasound guide regional anesthesia and laparoscopic surgery. And to some extent, we are where the, the surgeons were 10 years ago when they introduced it and discovered that it was a completely new set of skills that they had to equip, uh, equip all their trainees with. Um, and they really have used motion analysis a lot as a, as, a, as a method of assessing it. And we'll have a look at that to start with. The basis of this is that an expert who's doing a complex motor skill, such as a laparoscopic uh, surgical procedure or an ultrasound guide regional anesthesia block, should be able to do so in a shorter time and also with greater economy of motion. And that really means fewer movements, fewer movements and much finer um, movements. The device that has been used most commonly in the literature is something that was developed in the Imperial College of London, and it's called the ISAT device, and it's elect essentially an electromagnetic tracking system. Two sensors are placed on the dorsum of uh, the operator's hands, and the position of those sensors is recorded in real time and transmitted to a computer, where a software then generates these three variables, which is the path length, which is um, the distance that your hands move through. Uh, you can define what uh, distance constitute a movement, and from there compute the number of movements they make, and then you measure the whole time that the, the procedure was taken. From there, too, you can derive secondary variables, so you can get the average amplitude of movement, which indicates maybe whether they're making very gross movements or very fine movements, as well as the number of movements per unit time. 
So we took this and applied it to an ultrasound-guided supraclavicular block, and we looked at um, two broad groups. We looked at consultants and compared them to residents doing the block, and then we also looked at our fellows in the early and late stage of our training. So really, inexperienced versus experienced. And what we found was, not surprisingly, the inexperienced groups, uh, sorry, rather the experienced groups, all took a shorter time to scan and needle the patient. Um, they used fewer movements per minute um, to achieve this, and the movements they made also tended to be slightly smaller. So all suggesting that with experience, you do get greater motion control and greater efficiency of motion control. We correlated this with a checklist and global rating scale, which I'll touch on in a bit, um, but showed that they correlated very well in being able to discriminate between these operators of differing ability. The problem is, can we really take this and use it on a day-to-day -day basis um, in giving feedback to our residents? And once again, the surgeons have, uh, have looked at this. And uh, in this particular study, they studied medical students who were learning how to suture. And in one group, they used the ISAD um, and the students had this data and they, they, could, they could see how efficiently they were doing it. In, the, in uh, the second group, they had that data, but they were also given expert reference values, so you know, given a benchmark that they should aim towards. And in group C, they didn't bother with this. They just had somebody looking and saying, yeah, you know what, you're not quite doing that right. You perhaps should move your hand this way and that way. Now, interestingly enough, all of them, regardless of how they got their feedback, had immediate post-test improvement, but only the group that got expert verbal feedback showed retention of their skill one month later, and I think that's very, very telling. At the end of the day, my view of the ISAT at present is that it's a highly objective tool and therefore very useful for research because it really is the only way to quantify somebody's dexterity. But it's not intuitive to interpret, uh, it's expensive and it's cumbersome, so I don't see it being used on a day-to-day -day basis. What is probably more useful then is direct observation with criteria, and the two things that we use are checklists and global rating scales. In a checklist, what you have to do is generate that checklist, and that involves analyzing the task, an ultrasound-guided block, for example, um, and breaking it down into its various components, and I would argue that those have to be specific to a block, because every block is slightly different, just as we know every nerve is slightly different. In general, these are scored either as you did it or you didn't do it, um, but most people now are favoring a, a three-point scale where you, know, you, you did it or you did it poorly or you did it very well. The global rating scale is one that's very generic and it's, a, it's kind of like you know, where we just gay, said you did it well, you did it well, but rather now we're trying to break it down to several domains to try and make it a little bit more objective. This is usually scored on a five-point scale um, and there are usually some descriptors there to help the assessor make that assessment. Once again, are they research or practical tools? Well, they are valid tools, and that has been shown in regional anesthesia settings. Um, we don't know whether if we applied it in practice, would it really tell us if this trainee could go out and do an independent block tomorrow? That has not been shown. Um, but I think it's something that is definitely worth investigating. The other thing is, if we were to use it for purposes of certification, we need to have some certain cutoff scores. And again, these have not been established nor validated. So right now, they're very much still in the domain of a research tool. Um, this is an example of what checklists would look like. It's, it's an interesting, interesting study um, from this, this group led by McKinley. They looked at checklists reported in the literature to assess any procedural skill. And they were able to identify seven common themes and 37 common sub-themes that pretty much covered all the checklists and they develop what they call a generic tool. And I'm just putting it up here to show you um, those, those common domains because I think if any of you in the audience are thinking of uh, constructing such a checklist or even a checklist for yourself, these are quite useful broad domains to, to, to consider. And you can see that they pretty much apply to what we would do uh, when we're performing a block. Um, and running through very quickly, in some detail, preparation, the appropriate environment that you've assessed the patient appropriately. So you can see that they're actually taking some of that clinical knowledge and clinical judgment bit into account as well in their checklist. Um, infection control is pretty obvious. Communication and teamwork, again, I think we perhaps overlook that, but you know, I think one of the things that we've noticed is you've got your assistant helping you to inject 
it's very important to be able to communicate and our residents have to learn that and, and often I, I must admit we're doing it for them and left to their own devices I'm not sure that they do it that effectively so it is something that, that is a skill set in itself um, they have safety as well which includes a lot of patient checks to make sure you're doing the right block and just one of those domains then is the procedural competence which involves both performing it but also knowing your equipment knowing your procedure using your, using your assistance appropriately Displaying problem-solving skills, and that really me means flexibility. And the example I would give you is if you see some aberrant anatomy, are you able to then vary your approach to deal with that and still achieve what you want to achieve? Um, respect for tissue is pretty obvious. And quality control of outputs really means the outcome. Post procedure, I think, is very important, making sure you document accurately and that you uh, follow up with the patient outcome. This is a global rating scale, and I have to tell you that the ones that have been used so far really are just drawn um, lock, stock, and barrel from the surgical literature. And these are the domains, respect for tissue, and you see these, these descriptors that help people to rate them from one to five, time and motion, many unnecessary moves, all the way to clear economy of movement. So they're fairly generalized still, um, but we're, we're forcing people to judge on, on specific domains. When we compare the two, um, there are a little bit of differences. The checklist is very simple to administer, and there's some uh, evidence that an untrained person can just tick off um, the various boxes. It is very objective. And I think the one big advantage is that you can use the components of a checklist to set goals for learning. Um, however, breaking it down to the task can be very challenging, and to some extent is subjective. And the focus then of the checklist is, you know, how thorough were you rather than perhaps how expertly you performed each element. So an expert who took some shortcuts might score very badly in a checklist versus a trainee who was you know, very systematic. Um, and also, should every item be weighted the same? That's something that should be considered and addressed. You know? Is skin prep as important as how you handle the tissue, for example? And the other thing is that, in general, they are very specific to a given procedure. Global rating scales, on the other hand, its downside is it generally requires an expert observer and to some extent is a little bit more subjective. Having said that, it's pretty well accepted in the educational literature that these biases of subjectivity can be overcome provided you do multiple assessments uh, using multiple observers and do it over a period of time. And then all that variability will, wait, will uh, iron itself out. Its big advantage is that it assesses slightly softer skills. So if things aren't covered by the checklist, you can still get them assessed. And there is also some evidence to suggest that they may actually be a truer reflection of competence compared to checklists. The other big advantage is you can apply it to any different, uh, any different procedure. Um, it doesn't have to be procedure specific. Designing these things is a, is, uh, is a task in itself. One approach that has been used uh, and reported quite recently is to use error analysis. And th in this study, these, uh, this group used five experts in regional anesthesia, and they asked them to describe all the different tasks of an auxiliary block. There is actually a systematic way of doing this called hierarchical ta task analysis. And having identified those tasks, they then said, well, what are the errors then that could be committed when doing these tasks? Um, and they ranked these errors according to how probable they were going to be and how severe they would be if they did happen and would you be able to detect them and correct them? And they rank them uh, in order, and in this particular article listed the 20 most critical errors. It's interesting reading, but you have to remember when you read this that this is purely theoretical uh, and has not actually been tested in practice. And interestingly too, when they compared it between their experts, it was actually uh, quite subjective. Not everybody agreed on, on the, the various tasks or the various errors that went in there. This just shows you the various um, categories that uh, the, the errors could be classified into. As you might expect, a lot of it related to needle visualization, needle guidance to the target in terms of trajectory, and just the general handling of the needle and probe. But also some interpretive skills, recognizing um, the cues, the visual cues to tip position, as well as recognizing sono anatomy. They the same group went on to try and test this in an auxiliary block. So from that error analysis, they generated their 63-point checklist. 
and uh, a seven domain global rating scale. And once again, I'm just, they were able, this graph, what this graph shows here, is that they were able to demonstrate a difference between experts, intermediate, and novice groups. So they, in their eyes, they validated their clinical assessment too. What they haven't done, though, is again shown whether this translates into actual real life um, competency. The last thing I think has been very important in the development is uh, led by Colin McCartney's group in Sunnybrook. And here they used, uh, they tried to create an objective assessment tool using a Delphi method, which is once again where they pooled experts, but they pooled 18 experts across North America. And part of the Delphi method is that you go through multiple rounds of feedback. So you get a first iteration of, of, of items, you send it back to those experts, they refine it, comes back, you send it out again, and you refine it once more. And from that, they develop a generic checklist for regional anesthesia as well as a global rating scale. And I'm kind of short of time, but uh, I'm gonna, I would encourage you to look at this. And they actually have this, uh, this, this, this checklist for regional anesthesia, which I think, again, you can take and apply um, when you're teaching and making sure that your trainees observe all of this. Some of it includes uh, motor stimulation and neurostimulation, and those, those elements are optional. The ones I've uh, highlighted are actually the ones that have a little bit of subjectivity in them. I'm not entirely sure that they can be classified into not done, poorly done, or well done. Um, so that is perhaps one limitation. Once again, it has yet to be tested in practice. This is the global rating scale. The first three I've highlighted are the ones that are slightly different from the surgical um, global rating scale in terms of interacting with the patient, making sure they're comfortable, talking to them throughout the case um, as asepsis. And they do include one more domain, which is assessing an overall performance. I'm going to close by just putting out a question that the other thing we don't really know is where we should be doing these assessments. If we do them in a the clinical setting, as actually we do most of them now, it is a realistic, challenging, as well as a comprehensive setting in which to do these assessments. But we're always balancing that, or at least I am, against patient safety and welfare, as well as the time pressures of allowing this trainee to uh, continue to work away. The skills lab is probably the ideal method, and this is what the surgeons have all evolved to, and I think this is where we should be going. It gives a controlled environment which is conducive to learning, that the residents don't have that pressure, um, and it allows you to be more focused on the tasks that you're trying to, to teach them. The drawbacks here are going to be finding personnel to staff and lead those skill sessions. Um, we're still in the process, as you saw, of trying to discover what are the best task trainers that we should be using. Um, and once again, it's time. Getting the residents to devote part of their rotation to going to the skills lab, making sure that our staff have the, have the time to go there. So moving forward, I think it is paramount that we should, uh, engage in educational research in, in uh, ultrasound guided regional anesthesia. And we need to continue to develop and improve um, our assessment methods. We should probably be using composite methods, um, multiple tools, because none of them are perfect. And we probably need to develop block-specific tools. Once we have those tools, they need to have their validity proven. And the predictive validity is really what I think we should be aiming for. Does it mean that they can go out and do their blocks independently and safely? And then we need to think about then how do we integrate these assessments into any training program. Thank you very much.